everyone and welcome to the latest edition of the WEC and SIA Staffing Insight Series. I'm Francesca Brofeda and I'm Research Analyst for SIA. Uh, I'm thoroughly delighted to be joined by Denny Pennell, uh, a very active speaker on the changing world of work and of course Executive Director of the, Employment the World Employment Confederation. Morning Denis. Um, so Morning. Our subject matter really does carry on from the discussions that we were having at the recent WEC annual conference uh, and also uh, recently published research focusing on diversity, equity and inclusion trends in staffing. Uh, one of the most enduring legacies that we both agree from the pandemic has been the renewed focus on diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, it really has raised, uh, you know, the, the, the plight of inequalities and that of course impacts our industry and our clients as well. Uh, an area that we really do see uh, getting back to the new normal is the, the rise of the hybrid uh, working model uh, and the capacity to really positively impact uh, efforts in advancing um, flexibility, creating a more malleable uh, based work solutions uh, for lots of different uh, people within the industry. So, you know, I'm working from home today. Yesterday I was in the office. Hybrid is definitely a, a way of life now. Uh, and our buyer survey uh, does also uh, indicate this. So this is, uh, you know, what, what our current contingent workforce companies are comprising of. So they're a medium of 60% remote workers at the moment. And in the next two years, that will go to about 50%. So still a really high proportion. Hybrid is slightly different. So we're looking at a mix of 13% uh, moving to an anticipated 20% in the next two years. So hybrid, definitely an increased working model. Um, so Denny, how does the, the WEC see this impacting positively or negatively diversity within the workforce? Well, clearly this is a positive trend and a positive development. Uh, um, the, 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 the global workforce has never been so diverse, which is a good thing. You know, we now have large, you know, part of the working population being, you know, uh, women, but you have also ethnic minorities, disabled people, you know, uh, older people willing to work longer. So we have a very diverse uh, workforce at the global level. And that means that we cannot answer, you know, the needs of this workforce with just one, you know, model. So we need to have this flexibility in terms of forms of work. This is a way to increase diversity. This is a way to increase uh, inclusion in the labor market. And, and this desire for flexibility has only accelerated with the COVID. Huh? It was already there, but it moved from a nice to have to a must have for, for many workers and employers. Clearly, uh, the, the search for you know, work-life balance is, is there. It's even more, more than before there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, there is data from LinkedIn uh, showing that 63% you know, of uh, people uh, pick work-life balance as a top priority when choosing a new job. Um, indeed, the, 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 the growing uh, growth of uh, remote jobs you know, uh, is there. So we all want to have some freedom to choose when we work, where we work and again looking at the diversity of the working population offering you know purely one you know uh, standard labor contract is not an option uh, people want to work in different ways so diverse forms of work are really a must in today's labor market if you want to increase diversity and, uh, and inclusion yeah and i think we talk about the you know the business case for diversity within companies and i think that case has been made and reconfirmed many times you know organizations that do um encompass a diverse workforce are just more productive they're just more, more profitable than their peers um and obviously one thing that we do talk about very often in all uh, ways uh, that is the struggle to attract and retain talent so as you said, hybrid is not really a perk anymore. It it's, has to sort of come with it. Um, and it's really interesting to see the demographic of people who are likely to see alternative work if they're not offered this. So we are looking at, you know, 14% more blacks over whites were, were to see uh, or seek alternative employment. 
Um, LGBTQ were 24% more likely as well. People with a disability, 15% more likely to um, seek alternative employment. So if we are excluding all of these people from the workforce for something so simple, then um, our workforce is not going to be very diverse for very long. Um, an area that I particularly thought was interesting was the, the young. Uh, they are 60% or 59% more likely to, to not take a job uh, if it doesn't fit into their sort of work-life balance and also um, remote working. Um, and I really do feel organisations, um, especially, you know, a current trend and a future trend, and companies really can't afford to, to neglect it, are the, the young uh, I know we have an ongoing issue with youth unemployment. Uh, OECD uh, just last month issued uh, the, the, the rate. It's at 11.3% from January. It's actually up from December. So unfortunately, that the unemployment rate is, is increasing. Um, so how can organisations really include, be more inclusive of the young? And, you know, are we truly seeing that lost generation and maybe the impact of, of that uh, in that market? No, good question. Hello. On the one hand, I would say that let's be careful not to generalise too much with the, the youth, you know, uh, generations at work. Uh, it's also a diverse population. You have different expectations looking at, for instance, the level of graduation from the, from the young people. Uh, undergraduated people might have different views and expectations when it comes to work. But still, you're right, you know, youth unemployment remain, uh, remains a very uh, high issue and, and very high on the, uh, the political agenda. This is not new. Uh, it was already true before the COVID, but it remains uh, true even uh, uh, it is actually even more, uh, let's say, uh, on top of the agenda today. Uh, during our conference, you know, the World Employment Conference that took place earlier this year, uh, we had the director of the IRL office for, for Benelux, uh, who mentioned that actually, you know, youth unemployment globally is now over 15%, which is three times higher than the average, you know, adult uh, employment. So clearly the youth population has been severely impacted by the COVID, but again, this trend was, was there before. And, and clearly also we know, you know, whether, you know, looking at our own children or, or you know, people around us that, yeah, the, the young generation has been, you know, really, really uh, severely impacted by the COVID in terms of self-confidence, in terms of accessing, you know, job opportunities or even, you know, uh, traineeship. So clearly they, they paid uh, a tough tribute, you know, to, uh, to the COVID and, and when it comes especially to mental health. So that, that's a reality. So clearly we have to, uh, to take this into consideration. As an industry, I think we are really um, uh, a great opportunity for the young generation to enter the labor market. I mentioned so some young people actually when they when they are being graduated they don't know exactly what they want to do they don't know which sector they would like yeah. to, uh, to work for so agency work is a great opportunity for them first of all to put sure. the first step into the, uh, the labor market and to test you know different options different jobs different sectors so this is really an entry door to the labor market for those uh, first time entrants but it's also about skilling. And I think our industry is also doing a lot into, you know, skilling, reskilling, upskilling the young generation. So they are really be, uh, able uh, to find a good job and to meet, you know, the expectation from, uh, from the employer side. So we are also contributing to reducing the, the, the mismatch and the gap between you know, workers' expectations and the, the employer's expectations. So, yeah, a great role uh, to play for industry. And let's keep in mind that in most of the countries where we are operating as an industry, the, the, the share of young people within agency workers is overrepresented compared to the uh, to the working population. So clearly, uh, we are a favorite way for young people to access the labor market and to get the yeah. first you know work experience. I completely agree, Denise. Actually, I've had first-hand experience with this with my daughter. In fact, yeah. um, you know, she's just starting her first new jobs, and uh, she already yeah. has much. She's been with agencies, and they've actually been really very good with her. Lots of training, lots of online training, lots of communication. I was actually quite surprised how good they've been. I'll be completely honest, but they have been actually very good for her, and she has already started to have that really good soft skill approach that unfortunately if you don't have a job at a young age you do tend to miss so 
how do I respond to this email? How do I communicate with a manager? You know, very basic things. Um, but if we don't try and include them and encourage them to work at maybe a, an, as an early age as possible, um, those kind of soft, soft skills gained um, really do detach them from their future earnings and future experiences. So, yeah, I think uh, I can definitely give a thumbs up to agencies when it comes to youth unemployment. Uh, I think they're really well positioned to help actually um, provide a lot of um, non-tangible of you know yeah. things you know we're not just talking about a bit of pocket money here we're talking about lots of non tangible you know soft skills that that really do help um develop uh the the future workforce yeah and, and on that one if i may uh, indeed temporary work is really the, the 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 solution not only for the students as you say you know willing to to make a bit of money you know on their, their summer time for instance yeah, exactly. but also for you know Gaining experience on the ground and training on the job is very important within the agency work industry. Uh, so that's, again, a very good way for, for, for graduated people to really confront themselves with the world of work and, and, and to learn on the job, you know, how to behave or to react. So very important also for them to, to test uh, their soft skills, you know, with the, the reality of the world of work. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so definitely a good, uh, good example there. Um, Something that obviously I was at the event that you guys run. It was a wonderful event. Thank you. Um, but something that did come up uh, really from the, the conference, you know, which was Bridging the Gap. Um, and I do suspect this is in light of once again, sourcing, attraction, all various diverse candidates, um, you know, is helping clients revamp their employer brand. You know, people are not going to want to work for an organization that doesn't really now show how they feel about LGBTQ, show how they feel about disability. Um, and something that really did stand out to me was, uh, you know, are we an attractive profession as a DE and an employer? Do we put that forward? Um, so, so what do you think? Obviously, you're, you're a, a great advocate of the industry, but um, do you feel that as a profession, we, we are a, a good DE and employer or a good place to promote? Well, I think on, on the one hand, there is a clear commitment from our industry to, to fight against any form of discrimination. And this is part of our DNA. Uh, we are there to support equal treatment. So we are willing to, uh, to employ as many people as possible. For us, the key criteria for recruiting and employing someone in skills, and that should be the only criteria to be, uh, mm. to be used when selecting a candidate. That's, you know, on the paper, that's the value. And we strongly believe in the value that's of course, you might see here and then, you know, some mispractices that we are, you know, very severely fighting against, condemning and trying to work with, you know, some of our members. If uh, yeah. this is happening from a membership base, you know, to correct that, to remedy and to make sure this is not happening again. And I think you, I mean, you can see many, many good practices from our members from all around the world. So there is a clear commitment from this industry to uh, indeed to... Uh, to be as much as possible a promoter of uh, diversity, uh, equality, and inclusion. I mean, it, it, then if you look on the day-to-day -day basis on the ground, I mean, our industry is a very female industry. Yeah? In terms of gender balance, I think we are doing very well. If you look at, you know, uh, branches, temporary work branches, you will see most of the staff working there is, uh, uh, is, is women. I mean, we are, you know, people's industry. Uh, we know women in general, they tend to better care for people than men, you know. <laughs> so this is very much reflecting, uh, reflected on, on the reality of our industry. Of course, the key issue is you know, not only to have women, you know, on the, on the floor, but also at the leadership position. They also, I think we have seen some, some major changes in our industry over the last years. From the WC point of view, I'm very happy, but over the last, I think, more than 10 years, I had a, a women as a president, Indeed, you know, yes, yes. and we have, you know, within the, the WEC board, we really try to keep this you know, gender balance, and this is very important for us, uh, and the same for, you know, that diversity in, uh, in general. So, yeah, I, I think we, we are doing our best. Of course, we can improve. Uh, we want to be seen as an attractive, you know, uh, industry. It's true that in reality, sometimes we are still too, too much seen as a default choice, you know, uh, from young graduate, once again, you know, uh, 
most of us have entered this industry not as a first choice, but more by coincidence, by chance. But what we are seeing is that once you're in, in this industry, it's very difficult to leave it. So that's the good thing now around us. Uh, you know, we have many people who have been working for, for the staffing industry for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, so quite impressive. So it seems we are not doing that bad. But one of the core mission of, of the World Employment Confederation is to make sure that the high standards uh, we are living for, you know, are really indeed implemented at the, uh, at the, national, well, the national level and on the ground. So that's something we, we, are, we are working on. Next year, we will uh, implement a project to promote even further code kind of conduct, you know, which includes non-discrimination principles, of course. Several of our members have developed their own, you know, um, uh, training or, or education schools, you know. Uh, Ireland is a very good one. They put in place a, a specific, you know, uh, training course for, for training the, the, the people working in the branch. And, and of course, there again, non-discrimination is a key principle that is being promoted. So, yeah, we, we are doing, you know, really our most because, again, this is really part of the DNA of our industry and that's something we are fighting for. Because anyway, that's the only way, uh, you know, to, to move forward if we want labor markets to be inclusive and also to fight, you know, labor shortages. Huh? As you know, we, we are all facing now a tight labor markets. We need to source candidates from everywhere. And once again, the only criteria should be skills and nothing else when we are selecting and hiring a candidate. Yeah, of course. I think when we look at what makes something attractive, especially within the staffing industry, we, we look at, I don't know, maybe if we're looking at an attractive staffing market, we might look at growth rates and, yeah. you know, growth and legislation. And I think there has been legislation that has for some time now, uh, you know, uh, but I think organisations are really getting to the helm that they need to just do a bit more than what is legally required. Uh, and we do see this across the board. Um, as you quite rightly said, there is a really high representation of women within our industry, um, about 60%, but this does unfortunately go down to about 6% at leadership roles. So I think there is definitely much more. I think the staffing industry, when I I really, I, I recently reviewed the largest global staffing firms, in fact, and uh, the representation there is equal 60% within uh, internal staff. But that does drop to 34% at executive leadership level. But that is obviously better than the 6% mentioned earlier. So maybe we're not doing uh, too bad compared to, to other sectors. Um, but equally, you know, I do spend a lot of time uh, reviewing statistics and annual reports and so on and so forth. Um, and sometimes areas such as women, diversity, LGBTQ, disability gets mentioned very infrequently. So if we're as an industry saying that we really want to promote these people, um, you know, and let's not forget our clients are demanding it now um, that they want to be, you know, that it's no longer, you know, seeing a supplier diverse um, company with on the MSP board kind of thing, but, you know, they actually really want to see diverse candidates in all of our, our offering. So um, I think it would be a, definitely a, a positive uh, improvement to, to continue this and, and I know there's many of you know members you know DECA have committed to promoting diversity as one of their four sustainable priorities um, you know Randstad has had diversity KPIs as part of their long-term share initiative for quite some time already um, even the Japanese staff and firm recruit plans to have 50% of its senior managerial roles within 10 years so there's definitely a commitment there uh, maybe we need to now start thinking a little bit more about other protected characteristics within the industry. So, as I said, LGBTQ, uh, disability, uh, faith and uh, religion. Uh, but I think we are definitely progressing um, and I don't think it's actually going to be a, a subject matter that we'll, we won't be talking about again. I think this is going to come up time and time again and what people are doing and, um, you know, what they're what they're held accountable to. No, it's a very important topic once again and again the industry can probably do more i think we're already doing quite a lot but it's very important because as an industry we need to reflect internally the reality of the labor market you know if the staff working for this industry is not you know uh, indeed reflecting uh, the diversity of the working population in general we are not uh, going to be as efficient as we should be so this is also 
not only a topic of values and respect for the diversity, but also a topic of efficiency, you know? Sure. So we need to look like, you know, the reality of the labor market. Yeah, and I def- as I said, I definitely think this is something that comes from a moral perspective. Of course, it's the right thing to do, but also it does reflect what, um, clients want uh, you know we see time and time again in sort of our buyer surveys which are contingent workforce uh, programs r- rather large ones um, and when we ask them about future uh, workforce strategies especially around diversity uh, the most popular one is diverse suppliers uh, you know at least 70 percent have diverse suppliers on their programs and in EMEA 59 percent so that was uh, America's and EMEA um, but also the second most popular strategy is uh, implementing a program to, account, to you know, encourage candidate diversity. Uh, if they're not thinking about doing that now, they definitely will be doing that in the next two years. So I definitely see organizations uh, leading towards that more because you see uh, in the staffing industry, many new roles created um, that have the VP of diversity and inclusion. Um, many staffing firms, I think, are actually getting a, a grip of this. Um, do, do, you, do you see that with, with, where you are as well, the WEC within the wider uh, ecosystem? Yeah, I think that's interesting because I think besides what we do as an industry internally, let's not forget that we are also educating our, our customers, you know, or at least some of them. Yeah. Sometimes they can be the ones being a bit reluctant, you know, to employ, you know, people from ethnic minorities, long-term unemployed people, disabled people. And, and because they are just afraid, but those people, they will not, you know, uh, you know, integrate well into our company and so on. So we, we also have a role to play to educate, you know, the customers. Uh, sometimes we are using, for instance, you know, the anonymous uh, resume or CV, yeah. you know, to push for a candidate. We know that the, company might not be very you know comfortable recruiting you know type of, of person so we say okay this is a great candidate we don't show the face we don't show the name and, and ju- just go and, and just go for an interview and, and usually we're quite successful so that's also something we are doing and then again if you look at the statistics of agency workers but you know that better than me uh, the, the, the proportion of young people is overrepresented the same for people from ethnic minorities and uh, this is what we call the target groups also usually long-term unemployed or uh, you know all the workers they are overrepresented within our industry so that really shows that we are trying to uh, to promote a diverse you know workforce and really pushing user companies yeah also to, to employ you know uh, people with a different background yeah and i think there is definitely much that the our staffing companies can can do to aid this i, I see especially more in maybe us companies but the uh, sort of the, the the lacking of asking for previous pay rates uh, and obviously uh, there is legislation, you know, uh, so that's an area that people are trying to get into and that sort of helps uh, as well with the gender pay gap. Um, so, yeah, there, there's definitely lots of incentives that staffing firms can can do in order to to really get a more diverse workforce internally and for their clients as well. So um, definitely a lot of, of work in this area that, to continue, I think. Yeah. Yeah, big topic to uh, to keep on the agenda for sure. Okay, with that, I think uh, that that leaves us a, a nice uh, representation. Thank you very much, Denis, for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, should you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, always happy to talk about diversity. Thank you very much for your time. No, thank you very much to you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.